Remember Invader Zim? It entered the world as the black sheep amongst a generation of Nicktoons with its absurd yet unique sense of humor. Unfortunately, Invader Zim was overlooked and dismissed not just by pesky studio executives, but by the Nickelodeon audience itself. But what exactly led to this unfortunate outcome? Hi, I'm Nicky with Channel Frederator, and we're going to answer a question asked by many Zim fans who still love pigs to this day. Whatever happened to Invader Zim? Invader Zim tells the story of a powerful alien race, the Urkins, who intend to conquer the entire galaxy, converting every last planet into things like food courts or parking garages. Yep, the Urkins are an ambitious race. Zim is a delusional Urkin outcast sent into exile after nearly destroying their home planet, by mistake of course, during their first invasion. The Urkins then give him a fake mission to an unnamed planet that doesn't even exist. Much to their surprise, Zim finds a habitable planet called Earth. Together with his less than helpful robotic assistant, Gur, Zim must blend into human society and conjure up a plan to conquer the planet and enslave the human race. Unfortunately, his incompetence isn't the only thing standing between Zim and sweet, sweet glory. His human classmate and aspiring paranormal investigator, Dib, is one of a few humans that know of Zim's secret identity and will stop at nothing to expose him for the alien invader that he is. Invader Zim had a pretty memorable cast of characters that either made you laugh uncontrollably or haunted your childhood nightmares. Zim and Dib have been covered, but don't forget about Gurr. When an Urkin invader is assigned a planet to invade, they're also assigned a robotic sidekick known as a Standard Information Retrieval Unit, or a SIR for short. But Zim is given a defective droid who refers to himself as Gurr. The G stands for garbage. Gaz is Dib's sister, and that's the greatest struggle there is. So it's no wonder she has the wrath of six demons burning within her. She's constantly putting up with and getting roped into Dib's personal war with Zim, when all she really wants to do is just kick back, play some video games, and eat a slice of pizza. And believe you me, you do not want to get between this girl and her video games. Invader Zim's origins can be traced back to Nickelodeon producer Mary Harrington, who had caught wind of a little comic book called Squee, a spin-off of another cult comic book called Johnny the Homicidal Maniac. No, we are not kidding. For whatever reason, Mary thought it sensible that the man behind a comic book called Johnny the Homicidal Maniac should be given the chance to create a cartoon for a children's network. That man being none other than 22-year-old artist Jonan Vasquez, who had zero experience in animation at the time. Jonah knew from the get-go that his previous work was definitely not suitable for Nickelodeon, so instead of adapting Johnny or Squee, he began from scratch. Seeing as how he was creating a children's cartoon, Jonah got in touch with his inner child and incorporated several interests he had from his youth into his Nickelodeon project, like sci-fi films, monster flicks, Monty Python, the works of Douglas Adams, paranormal investigators, and of course, aliens. Before settling on the darker tone and concept of an alien invader, Jonan very briefly considered doing a more lighthearted show in the vein of the 70s sitcom Mork and Mindy. Mork and Mindy was a show revolving around an alien that comes to Earth not to conquer it, but to blend in with the human race, learning about and embracing their culture. Mork's adventures were usually a misinterpretation of human customs that would get him into many mishaps and would ultimately teach him a valuable lesson in the end. Jonan said that while this concept likely would have found more initial success on the air, it would not have been nearly as artistically liberating as what he wound up pitching to Nickelodeon. Within an hour, Jonan created a pitch revolving around an alien invader with technology so advanced he could easily overthrow humanity single-handedly, but decided to make things more complicated for himself by bothering with mundane tasks like attending school. Nickelodeon bought the pitch, ordered a pilot, and the rest, as they say, is history. Unfortunately, production on Invader Zim wasn't always all tacos and piggies. Given the dark and twisted nature of the show, it should come as no surprise that there was some friction between the show's creative staff and Nickelodeon executives. One of the biggest issues the network had with the show when it first began was Dib. More specifically, his design. Jordan Vasquez was adamant that Dib wore a trench coat, but the executives opted against this because they feared Dib's wardrobe would remind the masses of the two students responsible for shooting up Columbine High School in 1999, both of which wore trench coats during their infamous attack. While Nickelodeon lost that battle, they weren't quite finished tormenting Dib yet. They attempted to cut the character from the show outright, on the grounds that he was just too dull and uninteresting. Jonan fought back with an in-studio initiative he called God Save the Dib, a call to arms that invited the show's artists to make adjustments to Dib's design and personality to make him just interesting enough to avoid Nick's mighty guillotine. One notable change that came out of God Save the Dib was making his head bigger than his body, which became a reoccurring joke throughout the show's run. 
Invader Zim would also constantly find itself at odds with network censorship. In the episode Best's Friend, it was intended for Zim's friend, Keith, to be killed off at the end of the episode, as is clearly implied in the finished product. Understandably, Nickelodeon didn't appreciate the humor of a child being blown up on their children's network, and demanded the team add an extra line of dialogue that had Keith say something along the lines of, I'm okay, despite, you know, being blown up. Instances like this would become more and more common, causing Nick to make a frequent demand Jonan detested, make the show happier. Fans have many different theories as to why Invader Zim's plug was pulled too early. The most common theory is that Nickelodeon discovered the infamous Bloody Gur image, which they had prohibited from the show, cleverly hidden throughout some of the episodes as an easter egg. But this isn't true. In fact, Nickelodeon didn't discover the easter egg until after the show's cancellation, and were surprisingly unfazed by its inclusion. The cancellation occurred simply because the show wasn't getting the ratings, which was high viewership from the 8-12 to year old demographic. While the show was praised by critics and viewers from ages 14 to 18, Nickelodeon didn't think this justified the continuation of the show, especially when it was one of the most expensive shows to produce at the time. When Nickelodeon saw that shows with half the budget of Zim were getting double the desired ratings, shutting the show down just seemed to be the logical thing to do from a business perspective. The show ended before its second season had even properly concluded. However, the Nickelodeon bigwigs would begin to question this decision a few years later. Why did they question it, you ask? What impact did Invader Zim have? Well, have you ever set foot inside a Hot Topic? You simply can't take one step without seeing Gurr's doggy face on anything from pins to waffle makers. There's more Zim merch in there than Star Wars, for goodness sake. How did that even happen? In all seriousness, Invader Zim has touched the souls of thousands, perhaps millions of fans around the globe. Zim's legion of love pigs are so devoted that the show had its own convention in the past. InvaderCon was held not once, but three times in three different cities. It made its debut in 2011 in Atlanta, Georgia, while InvaderCon 2 was held in Los Angeles in 2012, and the third and final InvaderCon took place in Austin, Texas in 2014. While the con was not created or endorsed by Nickelodeon, the show's cast and crew have made appearances, including Jordan Vasquez himself, who even hosted a few panels. The cast did a panel in which they did a table read of an unproduced script for an episode called The Trial, which shed a lot of light on not just Zim's past, but the history of the Urkin race as well. While you may think Invader Zim's massive fan base has gone unheard and ignored by Nickelodeon, you couldn't be more wrong. Nickelodeon has been well aware of Zim's popularity and were actually considering a revival of the series for years. They began this process by testing the waters with reruns and premieres of unaired episodes on Nickelodeon's throwback channel, Nicktoons Network. These reruns did so well ratings-wise that Nickelodeon actually approached Jonin and the old crew about coming back for a second coming of Doom. I mean, Invader Zim. While Jonin was interested in more Zim, the budget they proposed wasn't quite big enough for the crew, so they respectfully declined in the revival. But Nickelodeon wasn't done trying. In 2011, Ricky Simons, the voice of Gurr, was approached about doing some animated shorts revolving around everybody's favorite dysfunctional Sir unit. While Ricky was open to reprising his role, nothing ever came of these shorts and the spotlight on Invader Zim went dark once again. Where can you find the show today? Fortunately for Zim's fans, Nickelodeon didn't lock the Zim tapes up, lock them in a safe, and toss it into a deep tank filled with sharks. As we've previously stated, the show does still air to this day on the Nicktoons network. But if you don't have access to this channel, don't worry. You've got plenty of legal options including Hulu, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon Video, Vudu, and even right here on YouTube. You can also get the complete Invasion box set, which many fans consider to be the definitive release, and rightfully so. The DVD have a plethora of bonus content you won't find anywhere else, like commentaries for every episode in the series by the show's cast and crew, just in case you wanted to know what kind of sick individuals could think of such twisted stuff. After Invader Zim, Jonan Vasquez went on to serve as a character designer on the Disney XD show Randy Cunningham, 9th Grade Ninja, and even worked on Frederator's very own Bravest Warriors as a guest writer for the episode The Puppetyville Horror. He also worked on comic books for various publishers like Marvel Comics, including a revival of Invader Zim. This comic revival reunited many of the TV series crew, such as writer Eric Trueheart, concept artist Aaron Alexevich, and colorist Ricky Simons, who you know also served as the voice of Gurr on the show. Puny Earthlings, thank you for watching Channel Frederators Whatever Happened to Invader Zim? Did we answer every question you had about the history of Invader Zim? Are there any details we missed that are worth sharing? Sound off in the comments and inform your fellow invaders of Zim's glory. And if you like getting more from your cartoons, subscribe to Channel Frederator, because remember, Frederator loves you.